got a real treat today. Look at this. It's a a Drenitz 656 Disturbance Waveform Analyzer. This thing's been sitting around in my house for many years. And I think it's time that we took it apart and had a look inside it. And just, fortunately, the shooting conditions are not ideal today. There's been a massive storm a few days ago. There's no power since then, no cell phones, no roads in or out of the city because all the bridges washed away. So we're doing things by cell phone recording today with what little power we have left in power banks. Anyway, disturbance waveform analyzer. So it's some kind of embedded computer thing that would be used for monitoring the voltage waveforms in factories and the like to see what sort of power quality problems they have. Double density disks. They're kind of wrecked. Now we might have a go at powering this up. I think it used to have some sort of touchscreen that may have been wrecked by that or something. This sort of grid that gets pressed together when you touch it. It's a CRT, got a printer, and I've already taken the top off. The keyboard is quite difficult to type on. So it looks like a Euro card frame with a back plane, two back planes, and then a whole bunch of cards in it. Normally lead acid battery goes there. Now uh, that's the uh, voltage input channels. Interesting, these barrier strip terminals have got pins on the back which go into small receiving socket things on these cards. Now I kept the battery cable way back when I first got this thing and threw out the battery that was in there because it was wrecked. And I've got some batteries over here. We'll try one and see if we can get this thing to start up. We're filming in front of the video wall at the moment. So I ran out of generators, tank of gas today, charging up all my stuff and running the fridge for a while. And now I find out there's restrictions on buying fuel because they can't get tankers in. So that plugs in somewhere down there. Some of those Molex UMNL type things of unknown polarity, probably that way. And there's a power switch on the back. Presumably it can fully run off this battery. Well, off the battery. And I'll have to work this out and get it plugged in. Alright, battery is now connected. Let's just put that in there. Kind of weird that that blocks the fan. Let's turn it on. Yeah, no sign of life. Maybe it can't run off the battery. Maybe the battery is just a backup. All right then. Okay. We'll f we'll try putting that battery into a UPS, and then see if we can power this from AC. But it'll be a bit beepy. Let's try that. All right, the UPS is over there. Let's see if we can power this thing up. Fan has started. Let's see if anything comes up on the screen. Oh, look, there it is. Insert a disc. Press spacebar. Oh. I don't know if this will work. The discs might be wrecked. Not in very good, not in very good shape. It's not making any kind of disc reading noises. Oh, does that mean it worked? Press any key for main menu. Guess it still works. Other functions. Turn beeper off. Plot RMS summary. It's not going to have any data because it's been turned off for so long. Sensor channel summary. Just four events. Initial frequency event. Okay. 
Yeah, we're not going to be able to see much more on this without hooking stuff up to the inputs, and yeah, we're not going to do that. We're going to take it apart and have a look inside it. I thought it was a touch screen. Touch the screen. Oops. Anyway. Anyway, I want to see how that touch screen works. Let's turn that off and we'll stop the beeping and let's take some of the stuff out and have a look at it. I've already loosened the screws because I was already curious and took some of the stuff out to have a look yesterday. So each input has got one of these, which is a, it's called a channel input. There's four of those, three phases and then an auxiliary channel. Then there's this other one that they call analog to digital converter. So these also have covers on them, we'll just get that off. And I think there's only one of those. Then we've got this called a front-end processor. It's got a Motorola 68000 CPU on there, some ROMs and some RAM, and then a whole bunch of logic chips. And then the final one, well, there's two more. Oh yeah, there's that one which you know, shouldn't touch because it had a really juicy battery on there which I already thrown away because it was really horrible. And now I've just stuck my fingers in it. So that's memory. It's a uh, low power static memory. And it had a battery there to keep stuff in the memory. Had a battery. I'm not sure what the battery there was for because that didn't seem to be able to power it. Unless there's something bung with the power supply in this so that didn't work. And then we got another one which they call CPU. And it's got another Motorola 68000, more ROMs, more RAMs, and more glue logics, and some UART for serial ports. Then come to the power supply section. I wonder if you can hear in the background there is someone over that way running a generator all day long and sounds like all night long as well. So that's going to be nice to sleep to low frequency rumbling noise. I'm hoping they turn it off at night. So this is a power supply thing. So the main AC input comes in their IEC connector and then from the IEC connector it jumps onto the board there. Got some EMI filtering type things. Got diode bridge, there's a fuse, there's the main switch. And then there's some pretty high voltage caps, 450 volt cap. And then there's some sort of transformer, which I'm pretty sure is a switch mode transformer because there's FETs or transistors there. And there's some other stuff going on there, and there's another board, and then there's this flexible cable which brings the, the signal to those LEDs, presumably, from over there. But what's quite dodgy about this that I noticed was this seems to be fairly sure that will be the high voltage DC from the mains going onto some wires that then go onto the DIN connectors and then must travel over. I have to because here is another power supply which is a 90 to 265 volt AC input. So it, yeah, that has to be either the AC or DC high voltage going through the back plane through these. Which yeah, I didn't think that was the sort of thing you do but here it is being done. I want to take the back panels, the aluminium panels off these and then we'll have a look at the boards, the other boards that we haven't been able to see properly yet. So assuming this video turns out good and I bother uploading it, it will be in place of what I was going to do originally which was try and get that video camera working. The MS1 by replacing capacitors and that one will then come later. Well, I do have a USB-C power soldering iron, so I suppose we could try fixing that video camera as well by replacing capacitors. Okay, so this is the the channel board, input channel. I've got some precision resistors, my shunts. So there's the inputs. Yeah, maybe those are precision dividers there. Looks like that kind of thing, doesn't it? 
Presumably there'd be some sort of range switching things going on on this. I don't have internet now actively to look up any of this stuff. Heatsink on that. Bodge on the back. So this must be fully analog since the other thing was the analog to digital converter. Which was this one, wasn't it? So let's see what that's got in it. Bodge wires on the bottom. And got in. An MN574AK, is that the, presumably that's the analog to digital converter. And then over here there's a, an MP7684, and then a whole bunch of other chips. There's just bus interfacing stuff. It looks like the real business goes on over here with some analog stuff. Do you think that's maybe an analog multiplexer and then the ADC? That would be the kind of thing that's going on there, wouldn't it? Guessing that there, and that track there all by itself is the inputs, four inputs from the four channels. Resistors there, goes onto that thing. I don't know what that is. Is that an analog switch? Maybe. It appears to have some digital signals coming over to there, which is a LS138, so that's like a, an address line decoder thing. Let's say then that's an analog switch. And then the output of that is probably there going into that thing. It's probably some sort of op amp. Yeah, maybe some of this stuff here is the reference voltages. Analog to digital converters. Pretty good. Whoa, that was another input card. Now yeah, let's have a look in this power supply. Since that's nice and dodgy. Some sort of little insulating piece on the back. Cover. Okay, so that covers over the back part of that the main input connector. Yeah, it's annoying ground wire, I need to cut it. Kinda weird. I suppose it's fine. The ground to the back panel, but then that's not really part of the rest of the frame. That has to be then ground through the screws and that pressing against the frame. And probably could have done a bit better than that by grinding grounding through the back plane as well. Anyway, let's see what this little board here's got. This whole thing's gonna be all rotated and weird, isn't it? Because I'm on the wrong side of it and the lights are in weird places. Because it's night time. Oh, okay, that unplugs. What is that though? It's just some extra stuff and some sort of resistor. A 2N3904. It's a bit weird. It's almost like that's a temperature sensor, isn't it? Something to do with that. Okay, with some more caps there. Presumably an output. Can't see the rating of them. It's on the other side. Let's see if we can get this off the back. I guess we have to unscrew those posts as well. Those heat sinks are attached by these screws and that's isolated. So the devices are directly coupled to those heat sinks and then the heat sinks, you can see there's a thermal insulating sheet and then there are screws with the insulating washers. We'll loosen those off. Drop all the screws inside it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so you can see the insulating washer thing on the screws. So that the screws are completely isolated from what they're screwing through. Let's try and do it properly instead of just using some pliers so that you get a socket on there. Nope. That one's too small. That one's too big. Typical. Yeah, they bend the uh, flimsy aluminium spaces, standoffs, whatever. There's the insulating sheet, no paste. Oh, look, there was another earth onto that plate. Okay. Alright, they're fairly well spaced out, the high voltage stuff. And there's yeah, those two there, must be the, the either AC or DC mains voltage going across. It is a bit dodgy because you think they'd leave those pads and round it that are no connects as unplated pads to help with the creepage of the board because that's a very small amount of creepage between those solder connections there. It's a bit dodgy. Rather dodgy. I don't know what these things are, whether they're FETs or transistors. The thing seems too old to be having high performance FETs in it, doesn't it? Most of this old stuff will use bipolar transistors. 25s or something, something old one with it. There is BUZ11. Is that a FET? Sounds like a FET, doesn't it? BUZ11. Look a bit crusty. 
I think there just is a regular transformer. I oh, know. Not sure without spending some time tracing that out. Those are inductors. Oh, it's just a little sleeve thing. Those look like just a standard AC transformer. And then this is all to do with the secondary side. I don't know, I'm not sure. There's definitely something going on because there's 450 volt caps. Definitely something going on. Maybe a long cable tie. CD4013. LM339. MC74C22. 4001. All sorts of good old CMOS stuff. Oh, and this one down here, deeper. Yeah, that is a, con a switch mode controller. A UC3524. That's a, some sort of PWM controller chip. And yeah, the, that's going straight out to there, which is gate resistors. So, and they're in parallel. And it looks like those are in parallel too. So two sets of parallel fits. It's going to be more than just a synchronous rectifier, isn't it? Ah, oh, I know what this is. This is an inverter to make a mains voltage to run this thing from the 12 volt battery. That makes sense now because the battery input there, 3.8 amp fuse, straight onto the fuse, then that goes to one side of the transformer, and then the other side is these FETs. So it, yeah, it's, it's an inverter, and then that is stepping up, which is why it's so weird. So that comes out AC there, various diodes, and then that creates a DC bus that travels over to this power supply. All right, so I reckon that's must be burned out then, or we didn't do something correctly. But yeah, a an inverter, presumably nearly 100 watts, since on the back panel of this thing it says it draws 100 watts. Okay, well that's an interesting discovery. So yeah, it must have been able to run off the 12 volt battery at some point before whatever's happened to it happened. So let's take this power supply off and have a look at it. Also, there's some more circuit boards in the front there. And there's also all the, all the CRT business, so we'll have a good look at that stuff too. Now we're going to have to take the bottom off because there's probably more screws like that underneath holding the ends there. And we can wiggle it out. We might as well take the bottom off anyway and have a look in there. Wow, some ultra stiff wires there. I don't want to bend at all. Plugged onto the edge of the back plane. Maybe this video will end up better quality than my others and I can just do it like this now instead of using fancy equipment. So here's a main power supply. Attended for installation in a protected environment. Foam kind of stuff under it. Don't unscrew that to get the top off. Presumably that there's some heatsink thing. Oh look at that. Look at the transformer in there. Toroidal, or maybe the, yeah, that'll be the transformer, won't it? So this has outputs 5 volts, 8 amps, 12 volts, minus 12 volts, both 1 amp, 24 volts, half an amp. So it's mostly a 5 volt power supply. And it's got a little bit of dust in it, some nice caps in it, spark, axial caps even, 400 volt cap, 150 mic. That's pretty hard out, isn't it? And then a terminal strip thing to wire it up. We need to take this out of the box. There's some carbon film resistors there. So you can spade lugs, so that's nice. And uh, this compares to modern switch mode power supplies. This one looks like it's from the 80s. It's the main input there. Interesting. Especially that. Toroidal transformer on it. That's good stuff. Don't know which one will be the primary. Extra winding up there. It's own stuff, or an LM317, and then it goes over to here. I don't know, would that be the 24 volt winding maybe? Fairly low power one, which we should be okay on an LM317. Might be able to tell by the voltage of these caps. 50 volts, probably, is the 24 volt output. I guess that would be the regulator for the 5 volts. Although, I don't know, you'd think that they'd regulate on the 5 volt rail and then be careful with the other ones. Anyway, that's a power supply. So we're going to take the bottom off of this thing, and it won't show us much more, but we'll do it anyway. Okay, well that's in the bottom. There isn't really anything new and exciting discovered there. Well, we can see the floppy drives. We'll have to work out how to 
kit, the front bits and pieces. I don't know if there's any room, any value in keeping this thing. I think I'd ever use it, plan to build any things like this. Just go to metal aluminium recycling instead of the landfill where it probably would have ended up otherwise. So many other things have done. Okay, there's screws in there. Okay, I'll come back when something more interesting is happening. Okay, to get this apart, the front off, there are screws up in the corners. It's all falling apart now. Oh, could they turn that generator off? It's in peace and quiet tonight. Okay, I'm undoing the keyboard. Removing the keyboard. Keyboard removed itself. Okay, now we can get to some screws. Which are in here, holding the front on. Yes, and then this front part will come off. And then I think we can get to the screws that hold the cards in to the frame. Let's see. Nearly. Oh, the front of the floppy drives. Now oh, these little knobbies. Now some kind of hex rotary switch sort of thing. Yeah, it's dodgy, is I wonder what's holding that. There's no visible screws. Okay, I don't know why that was held on. Oh, okay. What that is? I think that's a magnetic shield between the floppy drive and the the CRT. Some kind of layers of stuff with some cardboard around it. Yeah, I think it's a metal screen, like a like just a shield. It seems to be a metal plate in there. Okay, so it's some kind of shielding. Yeah, and then there's weird little brackety things that are holding these boards in. You can see connection to the touch thing. Yeah, it's nice to have peace and quiet. That thing was running before I woke up this morning. Solidly built. No plastic flimsy business in this. Just finish unscrewing all this stuff. And then let's try and slide some of it out. And yeah, I'm also thinking of building a, a, a siphoning tool for the car so get some new, f some more fuel for the generator. Since there's restrictions on buying it, chance of not being able to get any more in since the roads are wrecked. All right. Let's try and pull some of this during previous excursions. Okay, this whole thing's going to come crashing down in a minute because I've undone too much stuff. So I'll get this stuff out and then we'll take a look at it. Alright, so the two back planes have been separated and they're connected by another back plane connector. So they've used reversed um, gender on some of those connectors to help key them, I guess. And presumably they'd all be interchangeable. Is that true? This and they're starting that generator up again. There's... they switch over between there, so the channels will untangle themselves and remain one, two, three, auxiliary or whatever the other one was called. And then these other ones, that's just a bus. So I think it doesn't matter which way those four there can go any way, and those ones have to go a particular way. And then that's where the power supply connected on, or that one power supply board. And you can see that distributes into the back plane, and then that's the high voltage one with minimal clearance to other pins and minimal clearance to that track there as well, which looks like ground back to the frame. Okay, now we've got another back plane here. I wonder if that's the same thing, just with less stuff soldered into it. Uh, I don't. Most of the connectors are not populated on that. So the floppy drives. Floppy drives are done as a quite a neat integrated module there. You see the power comes in and then the floppy drive data. And then that's on a PCB which yeah, look at that, they use nice little header things there to go onto the power connectors. And then that must be some kind of floppy interface. WDC. Is that Western Digital Corporation 85? If that's a special floppy drive interfacing chip, the controller floppy interface. Okay. Oh, look at that. That's ripped off, so that'll be why the touch doesn't work. That whole thing has been ripped off. Oh, you can't see that. Yeah, so that'll be why the touch doesn't work. See, that track there is not attached anymore. And there's another crack forming. That's a little bit weird, isn't it? Let's take that board off and see what it is. Or was. 
Ooh. Okay, then. Oh. Ah. Uh. Okay. That wire is the connection to the to this, which is a front panel interface. Where was the keyboard connector? Oh, that's on this other board right at the end. Okay. So inside this, four connections. Presumably four? I guess so. It would have each side and it would be a resistive XY type deal. And now it's ripped off. That's a shame. Yeah, interesting. Oh, it looks like it's just a front that drives like a rotary dip switch type thing. Feel quite good to turn. And I guess that thing there then is the display driver. It's got another ribbon that goes. Yep, CRT. A CRT control board. Okay, so that's some video memory or video ROM. 20 megahertz clock. Alright, so through this board here, that's the only connection into the CRT. It didn't join onto anything else. There's another board on the top there. So power for it comes in through this backplane connector as well. There's a blue filter there. I wonder if the screen is actually a black and white one and it's just been filtered, a white phosphor screen filtered to look blue. Maybe? Yeah, it's just some sort of logic stuff there I'm cooking up on top of that CRT and then a neat spaced out uh, ribbon cable there and then an edge connector onto that CRT board nicely screened flyback transformer there I guess that's some sort of off-the-shelf module display module let's take the touch thing off and have a look at it no, oh, I think it is just a normal, but then it has this screen over it, which is just a decoy. I think that's a glare filter. Are you sure that was that? That's what that is. Yeah, because it stops light coming in from an angle, so yeah, it's the screen won't be sh um, washed out by light coming in from an angle. So it will improve the contrast. That's cunning. So it's got nothing to do with the. The touchscreen, the touchscreens are all this thing. It's just a normal sort of one that you'd see on the front of stuff where it's got some conductive clear coatings on there that have a resistance and when you touch it it's measuring the resistance from the non-resistive conductive surface to where it hits a resistive conductive surface and then what that resistance is determines how far across you touched it. It does that in the X and the Y direction. And then there's a CRT there with some nice burning. Guess it just stays on forever when this machine's powered up. Or at least long enough to have that burnt in. It's good, it looks like there's options. Instead of that edge connector, you can use a regular header, pin header thing. A little bit dodgy, there's a capacitor there that's being pushing into the, the CRT connector. Dodgy there. Oh well, printer. There is the connector for the keyboard to plug in. The rest of the back plane, the front back plane, the oh, whole screws. All right, so this is a. Oh, look at that! It's got an angled drive thing for that roller. Wow, that's quite exciting. Can you see that? No. Oh, heaps of this is probably not in shot. Probably. There's an angled drive wheel driving thing. And this board, they call it printer. And it's got this quite interesting ribbon cable. Not much to that. It's just some bus interfacing ICs, isn't it? 373s. Oh, and that's your then 2803 s So some. Does that sticker motor drivers? What drives the print head? Is it a mini a side to side type of printer? I don't know, I'd like to take all this off to find out. Okay, let's get this spot. So that's the printer thing for. Okay, so it is a 
see there it's got a worm shaft, the opposite of course, worm shaft, what do you call that? And then there's another one, stiffer motor there for advancing the paper, some sort of roller thing in there, and then this stiffer motor here for sliding that print head along, and then there must be some lines, oh yeah that's eight, is it eight? Seven. So those stepper motors will have four phases each. So that will be one of those chips. Yeah, they are two 803, so they are eight channel Darlington drivers there. So there'll be four and four on one of them for the stepper motors, and then eight there for driving the, the print head, so that can produce eight dots at a time. So that's like suited for five by seven characters, isn't it? Or just graphics when you can draw eight rows at a time. It's quite a neat, simple interface, isn't it? And there's a home switch there, a little button there, so it can get itself sunk up with the home location so it knows where it's starting from. And then just count steps from there on. Pretty simple to make a printer, isn't it? Well, that aspect of it is. And the keyboard, I guess it's just something like a PS2 or some of a clock in a data line. There seems to be two tracks that go off into the back plane. One on that side, one on that side, and the other is probably ground and a power supply of some sort. 5 volts, presumably. Oh, I wonder if that there is a take-up. And is it? Probably, so that the logging is just recorded and just rolled up into there and you get it out later on when you come back to check on it to find out what's been going on. Okay, we might as well finish this off by looking in the keyboard. There is a little hatch thing here you can open up, but it's a bit bent. Oh look, it's got more discs in it. 720k double density discs and some original stickers. And some screws on the side. Oh, look at that! There's another whole processor and business going on in there. It's called decoding. Wire over there for the connector, modular connector. 4-pin modular connector. So they really rolled their own everything with this. I guess if it was early 80s there wasn't really much computer stuff around, was there? Just use PC based stuff. Yeah, horrible keyboard. Very horrible buttons that they've used which are squeaky and difficult to push. They don't squeeze in unless you push them straight. And then their own special decoding board there. I guess that's special, I don't know. 1.8432 megahertz crystal. Just one more bit before we go. It's always another bit. Took the power supply out of the case to have a look at that. And I think that device there is the primary switching. I think AC comes in here. Filters, rectifier, pretty crunchy cap. But then there's these two things. I'm not exactly sure what those are doing. I was wondering if that's something to do with how it handles a wide supply supply range, but not really sure. There's a thing there called a UA555. So is that just a 555? I guess it is Fairch Fairchild. It's a bunch of transistors, some other sort of transistors. Another thing that looks like an SCR might be another transistor. And then there's that. Pretty sure that's then the primary. Goes up to that thing. Some kind of center tapped, oh no, multiple winding thing, and then that's got a little, and then there's the main transformer, some sort of bodge, multiple bodges, extra those things, diode, wire, diodes, something in there presumably. Now this is the main switching transformer here with multiple outputs. Interesting design this is. So presumably that's primary business, because it's all over here. So there's a split there between AC, AC, side, input side, 
and the output side down here and there is an optocoupler there for feedback there's also a pot so you can trim it so I guess those wires there are the feedback coming off near the output terminal so we get a fairly accurate measurement as much as you can within this unit and yeah, I guess the, the diodes no no that's LM337 LM317 that's diode that must be for the high current one then and then the others are little diodes okay so that's that's how the plus minus 12 volts come but was it 12 or 8 or something yeah plus minus 12 will be from these guys 317337 then the 5 volt will be regulated and then this one here must be the 24 volts of its own regulator so they're not doing any kind of mag amps or fancy things or relying on cross regulation they're just regulating the one main winding and then everything else gets its own regulator so it stays nice and clean and tidy I guess interesting thing old thing great well hopefully that was an interesting look inside a Drenitz 656 disturbance waveform analyzer and next time we'll do something else interesting hopefully uh, rack servers that we might take apart and all sorts of other things Great, thanks for watching.